I am the one hiding under your bed. Teeth ground sharp and eyes glowing red. <laughs> Okay, so the first known time this thing happened was about two, three years ago when I was coming home from a detention I had after school that was an hour long. It was about 4.15 in the afternoon as I'm literally stepping foot through the door. My brother and his friend walk into the kitchen. His friend looks at me and says, How did you get downstairs so fast? I was confused and just said I just got home. He started acting all weird with me, being like, stop messing about, you were just upstairs in your bed. I kept telling him I just got home, but he was dead set on the fact that I was asleep upstairs. My brother then went back upstairs and I just assumed he had forgotten something. At this point, my brother hadn't said a word to me. When we talked about it later on, he said the reason he went back upstairs is because he saw me too, in bed, and was checking to see if anyone was in my room. Since then, multiple people have seen me or something that looks like me around the house. It started off as it just being me, but recently my friend has seen my brother a few times. Once I actually heard her say hi to him in the kitchen and thought she was saying hi to me. So I went into the kitchen and she said, what the hell? Where did Riley go? He was just stood there at the sink. I was laughing because I was sat in the living room. So my brother would have had to walk past me to get in and out of the kitchen. So again, I thought she was joking at first. Then I remembered I'd never even told her about the past experiences like this. I honestly have no idea what's going on. All I know is something keeps presenting itself as me and my brother to people and it's getting pretty creepy. Does anyone have any ideas on what this might be? There have been so many little experiences that have happened in my house and nearly everyone has seen something. Not a single one of my friends have stayed over and not experienced something. A couple of more examples. Me and one of my best friends were sat downstairs. At like 1 or 2 a.m. she had fallen asleep and I was still watching TV when the door to the kitchen started rattling. Just a little at first. I blew it off because it does that sometimes due to the slight draft from my front door. But then the handle started shaking aggressively like it was being messed with. I woke my friend up and told her we were sleeping in my room instead. We fell asleep with my door closed and locked, which I don't normally do but my friend couldn't sleep unless it was dark. At about half 3am, my friend wakes me up and tells me my door just opened. I looked at my bedroom door and it was wide open, but it was locked from the inside and there's no way to open it from the outside. It also couldn't have been her because I have a single bed so we were pretty cramped in next to each other. I would have felt her get out of bed to open the door. Another small thing that happens very often. My great grandma passed away a couple of years ago and because my bedroom is extremely small, my nana, her daughter, gave me my great grandma's wardrobe as it's very small and could easily fit. I also have my grandma's engagement ring which she gave to me when she was alive. When I tell you I hear knocking from this wardrobe every day and every night, I kind of make a joke out of it and will be like, okay, come on. Nah, Laura, stop it. And it will stop every time I tell it to. There's also a specific corner in my living room. It has a big leather spinning chair in it and has always given me the strangest feeling like very uneasy. One night me and my brother and two friends were sat watching TV and no one was sitting in that corner when all of a sudden one of my friends looked over and screams 
then starts covering her eyes. I started covering my ears and freaking out a bit because I was startled. When we asked her why she screamed, she said that she saw a tall, dark figure of a man stood in the corner behind the chair. There's loads more that have happened in my house, and none of it seriously creeps me out, apart from whatever that thing is that keeps appearing as me or my sibling. Something about that makes me feel very uneasy. So this isn't probably as scary as most of the stories on this subreddit, but I'll put it here anyway. I was 16 when this happened. So my mom and I stayed the night at my sister's house. We were staying in a bedroom in the basement. The basement was completely renovated and had windows and a door leading into the backyard. So not very creepy. My mom, sister, and her kids were all upstairs eating breakfast while I went to have a shower in the bathroom right next to our room. Everything was fine until I got out and was drying myself off. As I was drying myself off, the light started to lightly flicker, but I didn't really think anything of it. I realized I forgot to grab my clothes, so I quickly dried off, wrapped the towel around myself, and went to the door. It didn't open. I figured I might have just locked the door and maybe just forgot, though I was sure I didn't. I unlocked it and tried to open it. It still didn't open. It was then that the light started to flicker more rapidly, as if someone was quickly hitting the light switch on and off. I started to freak out and desperately tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge no matter what I did. The light started to flicker on and off quicker and quicker. I yelled for help. I could hear my mom running down the stairs, but then the light stopped and I was just suddenly able to open the door right as my mom was rounding the corner to enter the hallway. When I told my mom and sister, they thought it was funny. My sister said it was probably just the steam making the lights flicker but that doesn't explain why the door wouldn't open, no matter which way I turned the lock. The whole incident, from when the lights started rapidly flickering to when I was able to actually open the door, probably only lasted 25 to 30 seconds. I've lived in my current house for around five years now. It's not a very old house, built in the mid to late 2000s, but I've occasionally had some odd experiences. They don't happen very often. Just for fun, one time I decided to do a voice recording while I slept. In the morning, I listened back to it. About 26 minutes into it, I hear this deep growl. It is very faint, and I mean really faint. I had to turn up my volume all the way to hear it. It was very creepy. There's also been a couple of times where I've heard knocks coming from my brother's room on the wall that connects our rooms. I'd go to his room to see what he wants, but he's not there. He was actually downstairs watching TV in the living room. I've also heard what sounded like someone digging in a bucket of Legos coming from his room as well, only to find out he's downstairs again. We do have cats, but they were not anywhere near his room at the time. More recently, something knocked on my bedroom door twice. I yelled, come in, thinking it was my mum needing something from me, but nobody answered or came into my room. Not long after this, I was walking downstairs, and as I turned to go down the second set of stairs from the landing, I see a white, misty figure on the stairs behind me. It could have been a reflection from my glasses, but there were no lights on and nothing shining behind me or close enough to cause a reflection. I'm not sure what to think about all that's happened. Rational believer here. I believe in the supernatural, yeah, but I don't think everything that goes bump in the night is an actual ghost. Things are getting a little too surreal, even from my head. I live in a small two-bedroom house. It's cozy but comfortable. I've lived here for about two years. Things started off harmless enough. Doors were always being closed that were left open, creaks in the house, random things that seemed to be moved. Nothing like that would be drawing immediate fear. My girlfriend said that she felt like she had eyes on her when I was at work and claimed that she would constantly be seeing something moving towards the back of the house. All doubt 
sort of got erased one day when we walked in the house and the back room door slammed shut. I thought we might have an intruder so I loaded up my pistol and went in, but there was nothing there. Finally, we just decided to have the house blessed. Well, that didn't help. My girlfriend left to take care of her dad and I was the one who had to endure the house. I started experiencing weird things, like my laundry being thrown around and once I found my boots sitting on the kitchen counter. The house is double windowed because the old lady who owned it before me was really paranoid, so it's nearly impossible to break in. It's doable but unlikely. To me, I noticed things were getting increasingly weird when I closed the door that leads from the living room to the kitchen. Anytime it was closed, something from the other side would try and open it. I thought it was just airflow until I started noticing that the knob was twisting. It was the equivalent of a toddler trying to open the door, but it would try in increments of three. Two light poles, then one hard yank. That's when I figured I was dealing with the haunting. Likely, there was unofficially no more doubt. One night after working a 16 hour day, the door started pulling aggressively. I was already in a funky mood, so I got up and stormed into the kitchen, where I started screaming at whatever the hell is in this house. I was so damn frustrated that I said, if you want to freaking go, we'll go. As I walked back into the living room, a jar of sugar flew off the counter and hit my stove, which was only about a foot to the left of me. I was scared, but I stayed in the house. Next. Next came issues while I was asleep. I would wake up about 10 to 3 in the morning, where I would get the impression that somebody was standing behind the door of the kitchen. I would freeze from being so scared. One night while I was asleep, I actually heard footsteps running towards me, and when I woke up, the door to the kitchen was wide open. This would be the first time that the door was actually successfully opened. I also have a small death statue of the sirens from Greek mythology. While home one night, I heard a thud in the back room and found that the statue had been decapitated. The base of the figure was still on my desk, but the head was on the ground. Also, while in that same room, I was checking something on my computer and had something slam behind me into the wall. It sounded like somebody had taken their palm and just hit it really hard. I was almost numb to it at this point. The last encounter I had maybe five days ago was when I got called to work about 3.30 in the morning. I was pulling out of my driveway when I saw something walk by the window. When I did a double take, I saw what looked like a shadowy figure staring back at me. I get chills even typing this out. I plan on moving due to work, but I want this settled. I don't want to pass this on to the next group of folks that roll into that house. I really don't know what to do. I know it wouldn't be my problem, but the last thing I want is for a family to move in and have to deal with this. Any thoughts? Edit. I was able to get in contact with the medium in a nearby city, but I kicked him out of the house. He was delusional. I won't get into him much here, it was just a waste of time. I did, however, find the previous owner's granddaughter, who I wasn't even aware existed. She agreed to a phone conversation where she told me some things that may add to some form of an answer. She mentioned that when her great-grandmother lived in that house, her mother hired a nanny who stayed in from what is now my home office, which is where we saw the door slamming. Not sure if that's an actual connection, but I found out her name was Ms. Alice. She was someone who claimed to be a devout Catholic, but in actuality was a voodoo practitioner by night. Apparently, this woman made children in the house pray to, quote-unquote, God, over black candles. When this happened, the lady who had the place before me would claim to see a large woman standing in the doorway, watching her sleep. This would be the door between my kitchen and my living room. A few other things were mentioned, such as them hearing scratches along the side of the house, seeing big spiders crawling around the beds that weren't really there, and seeing someone's face peering through the windows. Some of this is somewhat rational, but... I can also see how it's applicable. This is just the most recent info I've had. When I was pregnant, me and my kid's father stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the mid-1800s, which to me was super interesting until my kid's father, I'll call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy in the middle of the day. And when I looked, he was right. It gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room, and at night could see through the kitchen and 
It was as if the stairs became a dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they believed in ghosts and the husband was an abusive drunk and drug addict, so they had enough problems clearly. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly were having serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because the shadows scared him. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times and seeing genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye, or even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long spindly legs running out. But when you'd look at them straight on, would disappear. A few times I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye, look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person and sometimes nothing being there? Other times, you expect it to disappear but it would in fact be a person standing there this time. So weird. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room You'd want to look over your shoulder into the doorway, as if someone was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out, considering I slept right near the doorway and often would get a feeling of someone coming toward me. One day me and Brian were the only two in the entire house, facing one another about two feet away, face to face, talking loud as we usually do. Directly in the middle of us, we heard a woman's voice say, Shh. I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and asked, No, did you? Then we laughed it off, as we were clearly talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. They told us they assumed the black voids that ran on the floor were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved like they were being pushed, but he chalked it up to being stoned or tired. There was no breeze. The wife told me when they first moved there, her son would see a man in a hat, but assumed it was his imagination. How could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everyone, as it was right where it felt like someone was walking by the doorframe at you in the living room. One night, I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in and, to my horror, all three dogs were in the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house, and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations I had with one of the roommates renting a back room, it was down a long hallway at the very end the only door in this isolated hallway. I told her about me and Brian hearing shh directly in the middle of us. She explained she hears the exact same thing in the hallway if she and her son were getting loud, but was sure it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway. But I'm not so sure. Kinda new to Reddit, but wanted to share a few stories about what I believe is a bad spirit pretending to be a little girl that once haunted my house. The first ever encounter I had with the spirit was in my living room. It was late at night around 1am and I was sleeping on the couch. I had just painted my room so my mom didn't want me to sleep and breathe in all the paint fumes. I was about to head to sleep when something extremely scary happened. I took my glasses off making everything really blurry and I turned to face towards the back of the couch. Close my eyes, and directly behind me I hear, Maddie, which is my name, in a little girl's voice, being whispered clear as day. 
Keep in mind, I have two younger sisters and a little cousin that I live with. I turn around not being able to really see and say yes, thinking one of my sisters was right there trying to talk to me. To my surprise, no one was there. I quickly put on my glasses and once again say yes, hello, no one is there. I was really scared and hid under my blanket and grabbed my phone. I soon realized something even weirder happened. My sister, who is the heaviest sleeper I know, texted me at the exact same time I heard the voice. I still have the message on my phone from her that read, Are you awake? I answer it with my hand shaking and type, Was that you? And she goes, What? And I realize it wasn't her and tell her to quickly come downstairs to the living room. She meets me down on the couch and turns on the light. I tell her everything that had just happened. I begin to wonder why she was even up. So I ask, and she gives me a chilling response. She said, I'm not sure, but I got woken up by something and got this weird feeling that something was wrong. So I decided to text you. I asked if me talking woke her up, and she said no. And that part really freaked me out. After several things happened involving the spirit, everyone in my house has had encounters with her. Even my mom who doesn't believe in anything. One time my grandma, who also lives with us, told me that around 3 or 4 ish in the morning she got woken up by my little cousin, who was maybe 7 at the time, talking to herself and laughing. My grandma asked her why she was laughing and talking. My cousin said she was playing with her friend Rosie, who found out that my cousin was communicating with the spirit. Another time my grandma had woken up really really late at night, to the sound of my TV blasting church slash biblical music in my room. What's crazy is one, I wasn't even home, I was at a sleepover. Two, I never even watched TV ever, so there's no way my TV would be on, and at volume 100. Three, my door is always shut, because I have a pet bird, so there's no way the dogs or cats could have jumped on the remote. Four, I would have never had my TV on some kind of church music channel. My grandma said she thought she was dead because of the music. I have so many more stories, but these are just a few of the crazy ones. I don't get good vibes from the spirit which is why I think it's a bad spirit in disguise as a little girl. So my friend had moved into a shared house in the old side of Roseville, California. He invited me over about a week after moving there. He lived with a couple of girls who were in a relationship and also moved his newish girlfriend in with him. The girls occupied one end of the house, near the backyard, and my friend and his lady were in the bedroom next to the front door. There was another bedroom in the middle of the house that connected to my friend's room via a conjoined bathroom. This was the only bathroom in the house. So the first night my friend invites me over to hang out, I'm at work, closing manager at Taco Bell, and I tell him I'll be a couple of hours before I can come over. And he says that's fine. They just made some edibles and there were plenty to spare so come over and chill. A couple of hours later, I get off and head over to his house. Upon knocking on the door, the two roommate girls answered. They told me that my friend and his girlfriend had eaten some edibles right after making them and promptly passed out after inviting me over. Not that surprising when it comes to my friends. They invited me in anyway since I had made the drive out and also brought some weed with me. We played All-Star Battle Royale on PS4 until about 2am. When they were turning into bed, they directed me to the guest bedroom. So the layout of the guest bedroom is as follows. It is right off the living room and is conjoined by the bathroom to my friend that I came to visit's bedroom, where he and his girlfriend were sleeping. There was also a pull-down attic door on the ceiling near the standard sliding door mirror closet. When I had first entered the room, I jokingly said to one of the girls that the attic was creepy as hell, and I had to open the door once myself to know what kind of noise it made, so I'd know when to nope the hell out if I heard it while sleeping. So about 15 minutes later, I'm ready to sleep and I'm plugging my phone into the wall socket and setting my alarm. As I'm slightly bent over messing with my phone, I hear the telltale creaking noise of the attic door opening. I spun around and looked up and sure enough, it was open a few inches, but there was nothing but darkness to be seen in the gap. It honestly scared me quite a bit 
but the bed was much more comfortable than the couch we had been hanging out on earlier. So I was determined to sleep in the room. Ghosts be damned. I mustered up the courage to close the attic door, with some effort mind you, and lay down to go to bed. A little while later, as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard the noise of what sounded like my friend waking up, stretching, yawning and walking through the living room. I laughed to myself a little bit, thinking that he probably had extreme dry mouth and was heading for some water. Then. I was suddenly struck by a feeling of dread. I didn't hear any footsteps as the voice crossed the living room. Immediately upon realizing this, the light switch on the wall by the door near the living room flips on hard, like someone slapped it up with force. My eyes were already closed when this happened and, I'm somewhat ashamed to say, I shut them even harder when I heard the light switch. I laid there for a long time artificial light searing through my eyelids, and eerie silence hanging in the air. Eventually I fell asleep from sheer exhaustion, though I don't know how long it took or what time it was. The next morning I was the last person in the house to wake up. Everybody was up and in the common areas of the house making breakfast and talking. The door from the guest room to the living room was open and the light was off. Most strangely though, my socks were neatly folded and tucked behind a mirror, leaning against the wall. Tucked as in pinned where the mirror was leaning against the wall, even though I had kicked them off while laying in bed. I walked out to where everybody was conversing and, after saying hi to my friend and making fun of him for passing out, decided I would talk to them about what happened the night before. I started off lightly with the questions not wanting to be the crazy friend who doesn't get invited back to hang out. So the conversation went as such. Hey guys, good morning etc. So, did anyone go into the bathroom last night through the room I was sleeping in? Various responses of nope, nah, we slept through the night. Okay, so nobody would have turned on my light then. Again, nope, didn't touch it etc. And... Was it on this morning when you guys woke up and came out? Again, nope, it was off when we woke up, and nobody said they turned it off. Okay, final weirdest question, I said, half laughing. Did anyone pick up my socks and tuck them behind the mirror? At this point, they all stopped what they were doing, and were just staring at me. I thought my sanity was being seriously questioned when finally one of the girls said something along the lines of, wow, so the house is already messing with you. I stayed over there at the house four or five days a week for the next few months because of my curiosity about the haunting and the property itself. There were a lot more occurrences I can write about, if you guys are interested, that ramp up in intensity as time goes on. First, I'd like to give you an idea of the property. There was the main house with the room I've described and the bedroom attached via the bathroom. The living room was attached to both of these rooms and continued into a small dining room area that was then attached to the kitchen slash washing machine dryer area and an additional bedroom where the girls slept which had the only door to the backyard. In the backyard there was a workshop or garage area. I call it a garage because there was a manual roll-up door attached to the side that we never used as it was extremely rusted. There was also a small attic on top of the garage space with a full stairwell leading up to it. Inside of the room we found a fairly thick stack of old newspapers, 40s if I remember correctly. Inside the room, it was always the polar opposite of the temperature outside, like if it was cold with cutting wind then the inside of the garage attic would be warm and musty smelling, almost heavy. If it was a hot ass dry day, like it often gets in California heat, it would be cold as ice, with your breath visible in the air. As Halloween was approaching, we decided to throw a party with a bunch of our friends. 
We went about setting up for the party and ultimately decided that the attic would be the ideal beer pong spot. So we set up everything in the attic and while we're up there, we notice a door that seemingly has no use. I decide to be the one to look inside. Upon opening the door, I saw that the entire floor was covered with packing peanuts with another mysterious door at the far end of the left wall, semi in the shadows. Not trusting the flooring to support my weight and really not wanting to go in anyway, I shut the door and continued setting up. The party was really fun and went off without a hitch. We all played Pong in the attic with people going up and down with no problem throughout the night. The next day was a different story. I took it upon myself to clean up the house since I had played my fair part in planning the whole thing. Being one of the first people to wake up, I decided to start with the attic, clearing out the beer bottles, red solo cups, and random detritus. I managed to get the trash and even the collapsible ping pong table out of the attic and went back to close it up for the good. In a standing position, I tried to close the attic door entirely, and upon pressing up on the door, it dropped back down a couple of inches like that first night. Same noise and all. I tried pushing it up again. I'm six foot tall with longer windspan, so plenty high enough to press without much effort. And it dropped once more. Frustrated, I decided I would jump up and force it into place. At the apex of my leap, I pressed upward hard and held in place for a second. As soon as I let go, the attic door came flying down back at me with at least twice the force I shoved it up with. I had to spin and move to the right to avoid the heavy door slamming me into the wall. It was at least a hundred pounds with the cover. The force was enough to crack a glass covered photo and the paint on the wall behind it. After the party cleanup, things were pretty relaxed for a while, save one thing, the shared bathroom that connected the guest bedroom to my friend's bedroom had a very Salvador Dali feel to it. It is the best way I can think to describe it. The dimensions seemed strange, even though there was no real reason to feel like this since the architecture was pretty standard. On top of this weird dimensional strangeness, every person that occupied that bathroom for a few minutes or more would start to hear voices. More specifically, the voices of the other people in the house saying mean, nasty things that were always at the forefront of said person occupying the bathroom's insecurities. It happened to me on more than one occasion, to the point where I, and literally all our friends that came to visit, would come out of the bathroom and have to seriously ask if our best friends were talking the most messed up, nasty shit about me behind my back. I truly thought they were, until a fairly new friend came over and asked the same of us when she came out of the bathroom. I still decided to stay over at the house because I, as well as the girls especially, was very freaked out and curious as to what was happening. One night while I was at work, the girls and my friend were sitting out on the patio area near the backyard garage where we would smoke cigarettes. The topic of conversation got around to me and they said, as soon as we mentioned your name, we heard a loud thwack sound come from inside the garage. Upon investigating, they saw a hatchet that had been placed on the wall between nails had fallen straight down and stuck blade side into the wooden top of the workbench below it. A little info. The needlework room is on the third floor of the old block in my secondary school. It's on the same floor as the F and N rooms. Downstairs, floors one and two, are the D and T studios. The empty space outside the D and T studios on the first floor is the art workspace. The windows for the needlework room are tinted black. If you want to look inside, you have to bring your face to the window and look inside, even if the lights inside are on. A cleaner's experience. Now, there is this cleaner who decided to retire. She isn't working anymore. Anyway, she lives really near the school, and she can see the school from her house. 
She'll turn off the light in the needlework room, but every time she looks at the score from her house, the lights are on. She's kind of curious about this, but she reckons that maybe some playful students or maybe teachers used the room after she cleaned it and forgot to turn off the lights. One day, she was cleaning the third floor first. As usual, she turned off the lights. She then went downstairs to clean and such. When she reached the first floor and started cleaning the art space, she looked up and saw that the lights are on. Again. Thing is, no one went up. So why were the lights on? She got curious and decided to go up to investigate. So, she went up to the needlework room again, where the light was still on. So she brought her face to the window to look inside, only to see a pair of eyes staring back at her. She was so freaked out, she packed up and went home straight away. She retired some time after that, I think. Friend A's experience. Friend A can see spirits. She's in the art stream, taking art. Once, it was evening when she walked past the needlework room. She looked in and saw a lady with long hair, totally in black, sitting down and sewing. Sounds right, right? Well, it isn't. Because even though she's sewing, her whole hands are covered with blood. Friend B's experience. Friend B cannot see spirits. Okay, the upper secondary uses the old block. If it's a rainy day or the floor is wet, the upper sec will go to class straight, while the lower sec will go to the hall. As such, you can enter the class as early as you want, provided that the school and the general office are open. So friend B comes to school really early. It was a day where the floor was wet, so she went up to class straight away. She wasn't alone. Some of her classmates were with her as well. But after entering her class, she got bored and decided to go outside for a bit. She looked out at the third floor where she saw a student running along the path. But the student was running at the same spot, even after a very long time. My personal experience. Okay, in my sec four year, we had night classes every now and then. Friend C got really curious about the needlework room after hearing these stories. So she suggested going there to check it out after the night class. I was fine with it, so I agreed. We pulled another four to six people along with us. After the night class, everyone was really excited about going to check it out. But somehow, I had a bad feeling I was really reluctant. Because like friend A, I can also see spirits. Friend C got really impatient because we were debating whether we should go or not. Because the gate will be locked after 10 minutes upon dismissal. So friend C ran straight up the stairs. I was worried for her because she was going alone. So I chased after her and everyone else followed us. Now the staircases are the rectangle types where you have to turn after a short flight of stairs. We had our night class at the new block. And the only thing connecting us to the old block was the hall which leads to the DNT studios if you walk straight, which was on the second floor. Remember that the needlework room is on the third floor? Next to the DNT studios is a flight of stairs which leads up to the needlework room straight. Friend C ran up the stairs and I chased after her. She was much faster than me and was ahead of me quite a bit. But she was still within sight. As I turned and head for the last flight of stairs, I saw what friend A described. A girl with long hair that's totally black in color. She was standing at the top of the stairs next to the window, staring at me. And she was near friend C. When I looked again, she was gone. The rest of the gang soon caught up. I ran and again, we were debating if we should continue. I was really freaked out already and I was really jumpy. All I wanted to do was go away from that place. Friend C can't see spirits, so she didn't notice anything wrong. She wanted to continue running to the needlework room, but I grabbed her arm and told her to just go back, and that I'll explain everything later. She was reluctant at first, but when she saw that I was so freaked out, she agreed to leave. After we left, we went for supper together, the whole group of us. I told them what I saw, and they were all spooked. 
but I wasn't the only one who noticed something that's unusual. There were only two guys in the group who went. The rest were all girls. The pathway was lit by lamps, so there should be this orange glow, right? But what the two guys saw was that the path was grey and was really misty. The other girls felt really uneasy and as if something was there. But I was the only one who actually saw. I was so freaked out that night. I didn't dare go home by myself. We all shared a cab home. If you had studied in St. Patrick's before, you would have heard about the various ghost stories. It was built before World War II, and during the war the British had used it as a hospital. But it was later captured by the Japanese and they used it as an administrative building. The Japanese had a battle in there with the British, resulting in the death of soldiers and civilians. There are many stories about the school, but I'm going to share one that is not so well known as the staff did not want to frighten the students. During the war, the Japanese sent infantry to the compound to capture it. They did not use explosives and heavy artillery as they wanted the building intact. There was this one Japanese soldier that was given the orders to kill anyone at a staircase near the current heritage room that leads up to the library currently. The Japanese soldier knew that there were civilians up the stairs and was going up there to kill them. But what he didn't know was that there was a British soldier up there waiting for enemies as well. He slowly approached the wooden stairs and the very moment he peeked upwards, the British soldier shot him in the head. It is rumored that the ghost of the Japanese soldier still lingers there, trying to find people he was sent to kill. And many years ago, five construction workers were sent to replace the wooden steps to concrete. But when they took a nap there, all five of them died in their sleep. The steps were eventually replaced to concrete and the walls repainted. But still, it is said that you can still see the bloodstains of the Japanese soldier on the wall. This is one of my creepier, yet weirder experiences, and recent too. I still get nightmares over it. It was like 5 in the morning. My dad had an appointment at the hospital, so he dropped me off at school early that day. Seeing that I had two whole hours to kill, I headed over to the food court nearby to get some early grub. There's a store I like, which opens up early to prepare the food. I'm an exception seeing how I've regularly ordered from them, so they allowed me to take away some food. Settling for that, I headed back to school. It was then 5.20 a.m. I ate my breakfast as soon as I entered the school. The gate was already open. The security guard looked at me and told me, Better eat at the canteen. You're up a sec, right? It's best if you don't go upstairs. I was wondering if he was worried that he would get blamed for me leaving the empty food packet around later, but I assured him I'd dispose of it properly. He wanted to warn again, but it fell on my deaf ears. I know, I'm stubborn. Anyway, I managed to finish my food once I hit the third floor, which was my class's level. I threw away the empty containers properly like the good boy I was. Then, since I was early, I checked my phone. 5.36. Still early. Generally, the entire school still wasn't lit, so it was eerily dark and empty. I was used to it, though. But then, thoughts started swimming in my head. There was once a murder that happened in our school. I'm not sure about the facts, but a woman committed suicide in one of our level 3 classrooms. Curious, ballsy, and overall stupid, I decided to investigate. I peered into every classroom using my camera phone to videotape my progress. After scanning, I would enter the classroom, walk into the middle and do a 360 scan. Anyway, this went off without a hitch until I reached the fabled haunted classroom. As soon as I peered into it, I felt my adrenaline spike. There was indeed a woman. Her back was facing me. She sat on one of the tables, staring at the cupboard situated at the back of every class. I quietly positioned my phone 
to videotape her. I remember her turning around to face me. What I remember of her face still sends shivers up my spine. It was completely flat, smooth, and gleaming white. This woman didn't have a face. And then I blacked out. I woke up at exactly 7.36. The class was greeting the teacher and my partner was nudging me awake. I quickly stood up and greeted the teacher. I recalled my head hurting like crazy and I was unconsciously checking my phone. It was indeed 7.36. I was freaking out. How the hell did I get into my classroom, which was at the end of the school? The haunted classroom was the third from the staircase landing. My class is the class furthest away from it. I was wondering what happened to me during that two hours I was out. Anyway, we had to sing the national anthem, so I left the classroom to gather outside my class to sing. After the anthem and pledge taking, I noticed as I was entering the classroom, the faceless lady was among us. I saw her staring at me among the rush of students. I choked on the water I was drinking and tried to get a second look, but she was gone. Then I remembered my phone had a video. I wondered if I had her on film. I watched it and recalled the exact position of where she was. What was in the video, however, was a misty white reddish thing. Then the video cracked up into static. I noted this was about the time I blacked out, but the static stopped and I saw the white reddish thing filling up the whole screen. I deleted the video at that point and throughout the whole day I kept catching brief glimpses of her when I least expected it. The toilet science lab, canteen. I really freaked out at that point. I made an excuse and got an early dismissal form. It was 11 when I finally couldn't take it anymore. As I left the school, the security guard stopped me and chided me. See, told you to eat in the canteen. What did you see? I related what had happened. He spoke quickly. She must have possessed you during those two hours. Never mind. Go home. Talk to your elders and ask them to bless you. It will be fine. And if anyone calls your name, just don't look behind. Turn your whole body around. This time I listened to his words and headed home by cab. I plugged the MP3 into my ears and played music as loud as my eardrums could take to drain out any other noises. As soon as I reached my home, my grandmother knew what happened and quickly let me in. She asked me to stand in front of an effigy of the Goddess of Mercy and she blessed me. I headed for the toilet soon after. What I saw in the mirror was scary. My face was pale, very pale, and I had blood trickling from my temple to my neck. I quickly washed away the blood, took a bath, applied some first aid and slept. I woke up at roughly nine that night. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't recall what it was. But as I thought hard about this, I recalled what I was dreaming, the faceless woman. We looked at each other face to face throughout the whole dream. This happened a week ago. I'm still having the nightmares, but it's getting less and less. And I hardly see the faceless woman anymore. Thank God, actually. I have many such experiences, but this is by far the most chilling one. I vividly remembered it happened in primary school and I was 11 or 12. In all my years there, I have not encountered any spooky incidents and it was not known to be dirty so it came as a surprise and abnormality to me as I reflected on it later. Anyways, I consider myself lucky as I did not experience this alone. I was with my friend and we were waiting for three other members of our team. The five of us and a teacher were supposed to meet at school on Sunday for a competition. It was very early, like 6.30 a.m., and the weather was really cloudy that day, coupled with the fact that it was a Sunday and almost nobody was in school, and that there were very few lights on. It was very eerie. The only people we met were a teacher walking across the corridor on the second floor towards the staff room, and a cleaner auntie or otherwise known as a janitor. Me and my friend 
hung out on the ground floor as it was really, really dark, even at the first floor, not to mention the upper floors. Eventually, we got bored of waiting for our friends and decided to walk around the school. It was at a particularly long corridor. The classrooms to our right and the parade square to our left did the spooky incident happen. We were chatting and strolling, whiling our time away when suddenly we both stopped in our tracks. All around us, there was suddenly this loud, groan, groan, groan. It reverberated around the floor, the walls, the ceilings, the everything. It sounded like a very heavy and large invisible person, striding towards us at a very fast pace. I knew it was not an earthquake. The sound came from the far end of the corridor and was getting louder and stronger fast. Words simply cannot describe the feeling I felt at that time. The sound, the experience was so unnatural and surreal. It didn't sound anything normal. We both looked at each other and ran. As we ran, we heard this very high-pitched, very chilling female voice screaming. It was so loud that it sounded like it was just inches away from our ears. It definitely did not sound human at all. We continued running until we reached the canteen where it had the most lights and where our bags were. Nothing made sense that day. Who would scream like that? The aged janitor? And on hindsight, I realized no teacher would come to school on a dark Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m. The teacher that we spotted on the second floor, I don't even think that was an actual human being. This was something I've personally experienced in my old primary school. Rumor has it that the girls' toilet on the second level is haunted. It is also the only student toilet to which has a full view mirror facing the doorway. The school I was at had a funny rule where students are to go in twos for a toilet break. For some reason, I never knew why. It is a very old school, and in 2000 they pulled it down. It was called BKPS, short form, located at Kalang. It was after PE, where students were then required to change out of their PE attire to normal school uniform. As there was more than one class taking PE each time, the toilet was usually full as everyone was changing out of their attire. Thus, I went to the toilet located at level 2. Now understand this. I have used this toilet many times, as it is one of the cleanest toilets in school. However, little did I know that that day would be my last visit there. As usual, I went into a cubicle to get changed. While changing, I heard someone from the next cubicle flushing the toilet, which was weird as not many students used this toilet. Not paying much attention to it, I continued to mind my own business. After changing as a female, I admired myself in the mirror for a while. That was when it happened. All the toilets started flushing one by one. I walked towards the toilet cubicle to make sure no one was trying to be funny with me. I was maybe around 9 or 10, but it was no pushover. That was when, all at once, all the toilets started flushing together at once. It was plain creepy. I tried to rationalize the situation thinking to myself that in some shopping centers, the toilets are auto flush. I turned around and walked to the door. As much as I wanted to run, I told myself to keep it cool. As I was about to reach the door, it closed on me. Panicked, I knocked on the door fiercely, only to be greeted by the darkness that followed as the light in the toilet suddenly failed me. Helpless, I looked around for an escape route. As I looked around, I realized my reflection in the mirror was off. Remember the full-length mirror I mentioned earlier? Well, that mirror, it looked back at me. But what was funny was that the me in the mirror had blank eyes, like emotionless, with totally no facial expression at all. While here I am trying not to have a heart attack. It was then that I saw a bright light and was pulled out of the toilet only to see the cleaner auntie giving me a disapproving look. Speaking in Mandarin, she told me, you, 
I tell you many times, don't use this toilet, and you never listen. See what happens? If I didn't come quick enough, maybe you would become the girl inside the mirror already. Hurry, go back to class. After that incident, I tried many times to convince the cleaner auntie to tell me the story of the girl in the mirror, but every time she rejected me. Only one time did she reply. Kid, don't mess with things you don't know. Here is a story from an old school in Ipo, the Anderson School, a prestigious school that Perak royalties attend. It is now 123. It opened in 1909. This school has a boarding school for non Ipo students and also house athletes. The school is separated by a small river from Fair Park. Fair Park had a very old building which is now demolished and replaced with new shops. Back then the dormitory faced this old building. The story goes that an athlete, bright and young, had to train until late evening almost every day. When he got back to his dormitory, walking in the corridors he could hear tap, tap, tap sounds. Every time when he turned his head, he found no one and shrugged it off. This continued for quite some time and it bothered him. At the same time he noticed that there was a girl always looking at him at the same time and in the same room. She would always be at the same window, head tilted to the side and resting on the window bar, her knuckle supporting her chin. The boy noticed that she would stare at him immensely and fondly, as if falling in love with him. This bothered him even more and her appearance disturbed him. The tapping sound was more frequent and more annoying as time went on. Surprisingly, the boy didn't find it scary but irritating. Every time he looked back, he found no one. One day, after he had performed his training routine, he walked back to his hostel and headed to his room. This time, he heard the tapping sound again. He stopped to listen carefully and the tapping sound stopped too. When he sped up, the tapping tempo increased. Irritated, he turned his head to look back again, but this time he did something differently. He looked at the ground. To his horror, he saw the girl was crawling on the floor, following him and making the tapping sounds with her elbow. Her lower part of the body was gone, so she needed to crawl for mobility. My friend, the school teacher, told us this story about his school warden friend. It all happened on one cloudless night, when it was the warden's turn to sleep in and take care of the kids at the boarding school. He had slept there countless times, but this night was different. It was a hot, cloudless night and the moon was bright. Visibility was moderate and there was no wind. Soon, by 10pm, it was lights off for everyone. The warden's room was on the second floor. The hostel was overlooking two basketball courts. The school was in a semi-rural area of Singapore. The warden was instinctively awoken at 2am. He did not know why he had suddenly awoken. Nevertheless, he got up and went to the table near the window to get his glass of water. As he stood by the window drinking, he noticed that there was something moving across the basketball courts in a very random manner. Straining his eyes, he suddenly became aware that what he saw was a headless black entity. He rubbed his eyes a few times, but it was still there. Taking a torchlight, he went down to investigate further. He was scared, but curiosity got the better of him. There was a long corridor from the ground floor staircase to the exit door to the basketball courts. When he was starting to walk along the corridor towards the exit door, he became aware that the exit door was open. At an instance, there was the entity blocking the exit door. Both the warden and the entity stood facing each other about five meters away for a few seconds. All of a sudden, the headless dark entity 
rushed towards the warden and slammed into him, and then disappeared into thin air. The warden fell sick and was hospitalized for the next three weeks. He never returned to the school, even after he had recovered. He had applied for a transfer to another school with an official recommendation letter from the hospital psychiatrist. I had been to the Gettysburg battlefield many times and had always heard great ghost stories about the place but I had never had a similar experience and I was getting increasingly suspicious that these stories might be fictional. Nonetheless, finding myself in Gettysburg one evening I decided to drive around the battlefield and see if my ghost hunting luck might improve. It was a warm night for this activity, being clear and warm with a near full moon providing lots of light. As I drove towards Culp's Hill where the organized ghost tours never seemed to go. I drove slowly down the road with my arm out the window, noting the pale grey monuments that lined the roadway, when as I rounded my turn, my headlights illuminated a distinctly different monument. This one had a top half that was dark and a lower half of a lighter colour and reminded me of a Union soldier's navy blue coat and light blue trousers. Then, as I got closer, it actually turned to face my car. That's when I saw that it actually was a navy blue sack coat and light blue trousers, completely three-dimensional, but with no visible person inside the clothing. There seemed to be just a very pale illuminated oval above the coat collar where the face should be, but nothing else, not even shoes, so the bottom of the trousers didn't even reach the ground. As I noted this, it began walking slowly toward the open driver's side window of my car. As it casually walked towards me, with empty sleeves swinging at its side and empty pant legs taking step after step without quite touching the ground, my stomach tied itself in knots and my mind raced through a million thoughts at once. And not just the obvious ones like, what does it want? What will it do? Why me? No, I also thought, those clothes look absolutely real, and the weave of the wall is just like the ones in the museum. And if I could make my hand move, I could touch it, and it would feel as real as my t-shirt and jeans. Then, as it got within inches of the car, one thought broke my paralysis. It's going to climb in, right through the window, over the top of me, and into the car. That was the motivation I needed to find the accelerator and go. And as I did, the apparition disappeared as if it had never been. I raced back to the comfort of streetlights and people in town as fast as I could. But no sooner than I got there, than I wished I had stayed more rational and maybe tried to communicate with the spirit. Still, this had been the perfect way to convince me of ghosts. It didn't look like any ghost I had ever imagined. Plus the moonlight was so bright that I could clearly see the details, and with no wires or tree limbs overhead to suspend it, and the bottom of the legs not touching the ground, I couldn't think of any way it could have been faked. I called my wife at home the next morning, and told her I officially believe in ghosts. Well, this is my first time posting on r slash paranormal, but I think my experience is extremely notable. I actually remember everything like it was yesterday, even the date. It was on the night of December 28th, 2008. I was 14 at the time. I had just seen a Hershey Bears hockey game with my Boy Scout troop and was taken by my parents to a party that was being thrown by my father's friends from college. This party lasted late into the evening and in order to get home, we had to pass the Gettysburg Battlefield on Lincoln Way, 30 West. After we passed through Gettysburg at about 1.30 a.m., I looked out to my right, towards the battlefield and the peace light. What had caught my eye was a man on horseback with a Civil War-style officer's hat. At first, I thought this was the monument because I had passed through that area a number of times beforehand during the day. 
I knew there was a statue of a man on horseback in the area. However, after staring at this object long enough, I noticed that the object was moving away from Gettysburg, and I even saw the horse's head moving as it trotted along. There was also a light in the distance that passed behind the man's head as he rode along, showing his head's movement. There was also a line of black mass extending from the road towards the peace light and the tree line. My father caught a clear view of the man on horseback and this mass. He told me later that that was a line of Confederate soldiers crouched on the ground. However, what shocked both my father and I was these little blue lights that seemed to be all around the tree line, between the open field and the peace light. I later returned to the battlefield to see the statue of the man on horseback to determine if what I saw was simply my imagination. However, when I saw the statue, it was facing as though it was riding towards Gettysburg. It was an experience that I shall never forget. Let me spin you a tale of what it is I experienced at Wilson's Creek Battlefield in August of 2011. It started out as a girls weekend. My mother, sister and I decided we were going to have a girls weekend before I had to go back to college later in August. With mum and I both loving history and my sister willing to play along, we decided we'd go to Wilson's Creek Battlefield, which is near Republic, Missouri. It is one of the more famous Civil War battlefields in the state of Missouri and was only about a two and a half hour drive from our home. After going to the battlefield, we were going to swing up to Kansas City for the night and enjoy Kansas City during the day. Only another two and a half to three hour drive. We weren't worried about time. We had plenty of it to spare and had no set schedule. When we arrived at Wilson's Creek Battlefield, we toured the small museum and obtained our tickets to go into the park to be able to drive the circle that has been set up. The battlefield is broken down into several stops, eight to be exact. The first two stops were fairly uneventful. We found where the old mill site was and were able to get a look through the windows of the old large house that sits up on the hill. At the third stop, however, in order to get to what is known as Edward's Cabin, you have to walk roughly three quarters of a mile down the hill and then another half mile across the flat and over the creek. Mind you, this is in August in Missouri and is hot, humid and just plain out unpleasant. When you are making your way down the hill, you cross over a small bridge and then have the option of turning left, right, or going up a steep hillside. At this point, my mother and sister had given up. The sign originally had said only three quarters of a mile or so. And they told me if I wanted to press on, they'd wait for me in the shade of the trees on the other side of the bridge. At this point, I'd made it that far and decided another half mile was worth it to see what it was we'd come to see. So I continued on my way, crossing over the larger bridge and making it to the house. When you reach Edward's house, it is sitting in the middle of the field and about 50 yards from the house is a large placard explaining that the house that sits on the site is not the original house that sat there, but it's original to the time and was moved after the original house was destroyed. It also explains a bit of the history, how it was used, etc, etc. While reading this sign, I felt the ground give a little shake and I looked up. As I looked up at the house, the house began to shake more and so did the ground, except it wasn't a constant shake. It was a shake like you'd experience during heavy artillery fire or cannon fire. After only 10 or 15 seconds though, it stopped. While thinking it was strange, I was still determined to see the house. The grass was tall enough that when walking straight up to the house, I didn't see the stairs on the right hand side. So I walked around the house from the left hand side. When I arrived at the back of the house, there was a door. Being the curious person I was, I went up the stairs to try and open it, but it wouldn't budge. Shrugging it off, I continued around the house until I found the stairs that I had previously missed and went up to the front door to find it opened easily. Inside, there was little to nothing, dust an old fireplace and an otherwise empty one-room building. My curiosity, however, got the better of me and I went to open the back door, curious if it would open. Without a hitch, 
with little to no pressure. The door opened, no problem. Weird. After seeing the inside, I started back towards the car. By this time, it had probably been 30 minutes or so, my mother and sister had grown tired of being in the sweltering heat, even under the shade of the trees, and had gone back towards the car for the AC, though not uneventfully. When they decided they had had enough of waiting, they started back up the hill. About five minutes into their walk back up the hill, my mother heard someone call out, Mom! She looked at my sister and asked if she heard it, to which she responded she hadn't. So they kept up. Not even 20 steps further up, my mother once again heard, Mom! But this time, so did my sister. They stood still for a moment to try and determine where it was coming from, only to start up the hill again. And to hear, a third time, someone yell, Mom! Now, you need to understand, we were the only ones there. There hadn't been anyone before us, and we hadn't seen anyone after us. The people in the visitor's place even welcomed us as the first guests of the day, at a little before noon. My mum and my sister just laughed it off and went to the car. When I finally arrived at the car, they were both laughing and my mother looked at me and asked, Oh, did you lose your mummy? Only to fall dead silent when I asked her what the hell she was talking about that I figured that they'd grown tired of waiting for me in the heat and had moved back to the car when I wasn't back in 10 minutes or so. We continued to the different stops, viewing two of the battlefields and a battery. My mother had problems with the battery. When she crossed the bridge to look at the cannons, she became physically ill. But when recrossing it, the symptoms were gone. She'd cross again only to get sick again. I quickly looked over the cannons and returned to my mum's sister in car and we started back down the path to the seventh stop, Totten's Battery and Bloody Hill. While on the way towards Bloody Hill, things turned stranger. I had brought along a camera that I had been taking pictures with, and while we were driving towards Bloody Hill, my camera turned itself on. The only way I knew it turned on was that it was a digital camera, that when you turned it on, the lens extended out. Thinking, it was kind of strange for the camera to turn on by itself. I pointed it out the window and took a couple of pictures. Let me just say, we definitely weren't alone. When we got to Bloody Hill, both my sister and my mother were done. So I went up to the placard by myself as they sat in the car. The placards explained that this was General Lyon's last stand. And at the bottom of the hill are three cannons. So I zoomed in and took the picture and off we went. But again, we learned we weren't alone. All in all, it was an interesting time with lots of history to be learned and a fair amount of strangeness to be had for all. I've never told anyone about this, except my mom, because I don't think anyone else would believe me. When I was 13 or so, my parents drove our family from Texas to Virginia to visit family. My mom is all about things being educational and killing two birds with one stone. So one of our stops was in Gettysburg. We took a day to tour the town and the battlefields, and then we're supposed to stay in a and b that night. The B&B was located either right on or very, very close to one of the battlefields. I don't remember which it was. The entire town was super creepy, and the B&B &B had a weird feel to it, like there was a tension in the air. We checked in and everyone went to bed. Around 3am, I woke up, completely alert. Despite it being mid-July in a 19th century building with a window unit AC that limped along just enough to keep the temperature below 80, the room was ice cold, and there was something standing next to me. I'm very glad I had the presence of mind to not open my eyes, or even move an inch. I'm pretty sure it knew I was awake anyways, because after about 30 seconds, I could feel it lean down and look me straight in the face. It did not like me or my family. It wanted us out. I could feel how angry it was. After a while, it left my side of the bed and went to look at my brother, my dad, and my mom. 
It stayed longest by my dad for some reason. I could tell because I could feel its footsteps on the floor. There wasn't a sound, but there was that definite feel of heavy feet on the floorboards. It came back around to me again and stood for a long time. Very close. Very hateful. Then it was just gone. I can't tell you how I knew it hated us and wanted us gone. It was like that feeling you get when someone is angry at you, but you don't know why and you're scared to ask. Turned up to 11. I kept this to myself until about 18 months ago, when I told my mom that I hated Gettysburg and wouldn't ever stay there again. She just said, Is it because of that thing that was in the hotel room? I saw it too. Which, you know, of course it is. And that's why I'm never going back to Gettysburg. I was around 18 at the time of my experience, and it happened at the Oriskany Battlefield. For those unfamiliar with the Battle of Oriskany, it was considered one of the bloodiest battles of the Revolutionary War. I want to get into my experience, so I will quickly sum up the battle that took place on this site, August 6th, 1777. As the story goes, around 800 patriots were marching to a nearby fort when they stopped at a small creek to drink some water before continuing their march towards the destination, which was six miles away. The creek is located at the bottom of a ravine and has two fields on each side, with it being more heavily wooded at the bottom around the creek. A large force, mainly consisting of Native Americans who were British loyalists, had picked this spot to set up an ambush, which had caught the Patriots off guard and started the battle which resulted in over 400 deaths. Rumor has it that the small creek at the bottom of the ravine ran red for some time after the battle and that many of the injured men left behind had an agonizing death due to their injuries and being subjected to the elements. Getting back to my experience at the battlefield, I've had many unexplained things happen while at the battlefield, but I'm going to tell the one that scared me the most. I had gone to the battlefield during a summer's night with one of my close friends. We didn't walk down the ravine but stayed between the field and where the ground started to dip, going down to the creek. At the time of my experience we were both sitting down and had been silent for about 30 seconds when we suddenly heard a sound in the distance, which we both questioned, but quickly agreed that it was most likely a truck driving on a road in the distance. It was within the first five seconds after we stopped talking that whatever was around us had made itself known. Both our heads were facing the same direction and we suddenly heard a very distinctive deep breathing behind us. The best way I can describe the sound is if someone was gasping for air through only their mouth but they were doing it at a much slower pace than someone who might actually be gasping for air. At this point, we looked at each other, and the sound became louder and louder, and sounded as though it originated from three feet behind our heads. I wish at that time we decided to stay and try to debunk the situation. However, it didn't take long before we ran away. What was rather interesting is how the sound followed us as we ran. It was as if no matter how fast or far we ran, the sound's origin would always be three feet behind our heads. Eventually, as we got further away from the field, the sound stopped and the feeling of being followed had gone away with it. Once we calmed down and got into our cars, we drove our separate ways to our childhood homes. Here is where things get really interesting. This was a time where all the teenagers were just getting into texting and AOL Instant Messenger was a big communication hub. Like most kids around my age at that time, I would always go on AIM for an hour or so before bed. While on, I received a message from my friend who was with me at the battlefield. He had told me that he couldn't find his phone and thinks he dropped it during our run while being chased by that gasping sound. 
He later drove to my house, where we gained the courage to drive back to the same place we frantically ran out of. We cautiously walked side by side into the battlefield to retrace our steps, while I kept calling his phone to see if we could hear it vibrate or see the small caller ID screen light up on front of the flip phone. We were still shook up about our experience, which was still fresh in our minds since it was only about an hour and a half since it had happened. We power walked into the area since we didn't want to be there, but also had to take our time looking for his phone. As soon as we got to the same location where the gasping sounds stopped, it started again and began to follow us like before. My friend kept saying, I'm only here for my phone, but the sound was still following us and sounding more and more menacing and louder with each gasp it made. Luckily, we had located the phone only after about 15 seconds of the sound following us. We turned around and sprinted away just as we did before. Oddly enough, the same thing happened where the sound turned around as well, followed us, and stopped at the same location. It has been almost 10 years since this happened, and we can't help but find ourselves talking about this experience among ourselves and with others around us. I suppose we were lucky to have experienced this together and have someone else to talk with about it over the years. So this weekend, my husband and I made our first trip to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We stayed at an inn that was once inhabited by a girl named Tilly Pierce and her family. And during the Civil War, the house was a makeshift hospital. I've never had any experiences with the paranormal, so I wasn't expecting to here, even though it's said the house is haunted. The first night we stayed there, Sunday, we decided to take a walk around town around 9.30 or 10 p.m. While we were getting ready, the light on the nightstand was flickering like crazy. Creepy, but could be explained, so we just unplugged it. We headed out for a walk and no one was out. It had just rained and the bars and restaurants were closed, so not much to do, but we were new in town and wanted to scope things out for the daylight. We got back in at almost midnight climbed up the creaking stairs and to our room. To briefly describe our room, it was a street view room that sat above the dining room area of the house. The other guests in the inn were fast asleep by the time we got back. We sat on the bed for about 10, maybe 15 minutes, and out of nowhere we heard a young girl start singing. I'd say mid-song, no music. The song sounded like some type of hymn or maybe a popular song among the young people of that time. After about 30 seconds of singing, a muffled woman's voice, almost scolding, said something like, You're 15. And that's all we could make out. Again, no one was on the sidewalks and we saw the other guests. No young girls were in attendance. The sounds came from directly below us in the dining room area and we had just walked in about 20 minutes prior to a darkened house. We both looked at each other in shock, but still didn't register that it could be a spirit that we just overheard. Monday came and went, and Tuesday morning we gathered for breakfast at the dining room table of the inn with the other guests. The innkeeper was talking about the history of the house, and had mentioned that he brought a psychic in, and she had felt the presence of a young girl, possibly Tilly. Another guest says, wasn't she 15? My husband and I practically broke our necks looking at each other when we recalled what we heard Sunday night. Now, Tilly didn't pass away in the house, or even Gettysburg, but could it be a residual haunting? We both heard it so clear and loud. It was like we were hearing a snippet of a memory, but it wasn't bad or scary. It was actually very beautiful. There was one time I was staying at a hotel in Madrid, not too far from the airport, and by the time my buddy and I arrived there it was 11pm. I had completely messed up the booking information, 
because I forgot we were losing a day by traveling from California. My buddy and I arrived at the hotel late and tired. Still, we were given our room number, a card, and sent to our room. I noticed that the more turns we made down the hallway, the less lights worked. By the time we reached our room door, it was dark and scary. I didn't want to say anything implying I was feeling uneasy about the room because I was 24 at the time. I had to be tough. And my buddy was 27. Once we opened the door, the room was bright and looked very modern. I felt a whole lot better entering the room. The room was supposed to have two full-size beds, but for some reason, they were pushed together to make a giant bed. My buddy and I agreed that it wasn't a big deal, just to stay on our sides of the bed and deal with it tomorrow when we weren't so tired. I slept on the left and he slept on the right. Sometime between 1am to 4am, when it was very dark in the room, I woke up and saw a man standing in the corner of our room. I knew for sure this man wasn't my friend. My buddy Cody is about 6'2 and 195 pounds. The man standing in the corner looked about 5'10 and 180 pounds. This was the first and only time I ever experienced sleep paralysis. I remember staring at the guy, who appeared to have his back to me, facing the corner of the room closest to me, as if he was counting for a game of hide and seek. I stared at my arm, hanging off the bed to the left, and focused all of my energy and strength to move it, but I could not move. I tried to scream for Cody to wake up, so at least he could know of the man in the room, but nothing came out. I've never panicked so hard in my life, and before I knew it, my eyes closed and I was unconscious again. It wasn't until 7.30am I woke up and screamed, Cody, and hit him. It was as if everything I tried to do during the night suddenly came out at once. He woke up, startled of course, as I came to the realization that everything was okay. The order of everything I'm about to say next is how I knew there was a ghost in that room. I told Cody, dude, I just freaked out. It's just that last night, and before I was able to finish my sentence, Cody said, did you see the guy in the corner? My jaw dropped as he told me he experienced the exact same thing as me the night before. He had sleep paralysis and couldn't move as he stared at the guy in the corner. We had all of our belongings still and nothing was changed about the room. It still freaks me out to this day how we could never explain what happened that night, or how we were both able to experience the same thing. Cody ended up experiencing another ghost in a hostel we stayed at, but as for me, that was the only ghost experience I had while traveling. My story takes place in 2018. Picture it, New Orleans during Halloween or crew de boo season. My parents and I were there to celebrate my father's birthday. I was also attending a healthcare conference to present research. We had decided to stay at the Hotel Monteleone, located in the French Quarter, because that's where my conference was taking place. Little did I know, it's also known for being haunted. As a psychic medium, I was fully prepared to have many paranormal experiences, but I was not prepared for what happened to both of my parents soon after we arrived. On the first night of our arrival, my parents had to stay in my room because their room was double booked. That night, I woke up around 2 a.m. to find my father sitting up in his bed across from mine. There was a thin, androgynous, eight-foot-tall being touching his leg. I watched for a few minutes. My dad laid back down, and the benevolent being disappeared. The next day I asked my dad about it, and he said he was visited by an alien being who told him he was healing his sciatica pain. Indeed, his pain disappeared for months and months. Four days later, 
My parents are now staying in their room. On the last morning of our stay, my father rings me to please come to their room. I get there and I see that they're both anxious and bewildered. My father then proceeds to tell me that he knows my mother was possessed by a spirit the night before, who kept insisting that she jump from the window in her room. My dad stated that around 3 a.m. the night before, my mother woke him up to tell him to hold her hand and to not let her go. My father thought my mother was having a stroke because her face looked faded somehow. She was there but not, he said. His intuition told him to keep guard. My mother recounted that she felt when a young woman had entered her body, but she pushed past her to ask my father to hold her hands until morning came. She said the woman kept asking her to go to the window and jump. My mother said all she could do was pray for protection. She said she focused on my dad and asked the spirit to leave her. We left New Orleans a little shaken, but okay. When we got back home, I reached out to the hotel and spoke to the manager about the incident. He informed me that he'd worked there for five years, and I was the third person he spoke to who had this experience. He validated that there was a story that a young woman had jumped to her death from that room after being jilted by a lover. I sure do wish they had disclosed that information prior to me booking that room. Now I know better. I ask before I book. In May of 2021, I booked a room in the New Orleans Hotel in Eureka Springs. I hadn't really picked up any strange vibes when staying there prior. However, there were a few different instances this time around. The very first night I had fallen asleep, I was awoken by what felt like a human finger poking my toes. I was sleeping alone. The second night, I had fallen asleep and again felt a human finger poking my nose. The third night, I was playing my Nintendo Switch and felt fingers or fingernails running through my hair as it stood straight up as if someone had rubbed a balloon on my head. Whatever it was, it definitely felt feminine. My mother, who was sleeping on the bed as I slept on the couch, had said she felt someone sitting at the end of the bed. However, I was asleep during this time. My mother had sat on the balcony which overlooked part of downtown Eureka Springs one morning and noticed the doorknob jiggling as if someone was twisting it on the other end, yet no one was present. I couldn't really find any stories regarding the hotel being haunted, save for a story regarding a man that was crushed by the elevator, yet this energy felt feminine. I read a similar story from a guest. They complained of the same in the room across the hall, that they felt someone sit on the bed early in the morning. During the summer of 2009, shortly after graduating high school, my father and I traveled to Estes Park, Colorado. I'd always been fascinated by the paranormal and convinced him to book a room at the infamous Stanley Hotel. Upon arrival, something certainly felt odd about the building. Not necessarily negative, yet a strange tension filled the air. The hotel offers its own ghost tours, where guides recount various reports of encounters with the hotel's many spirits. Jim Carrey had apparently left the hotel in a flustered panic while filming Dumber and Dumber, in 1994. Stephen King had of course wandered the halls alone in the late 70s during the hotel's off season, which would inspire him to write The Shining. Either that very night or the following night, my father and I decided to perform our own seance of sorts. Nothing could help me anticipate the events that followed. We had first asked if there's any spirits in the room, could you please respond by knocking? 
This was followed by a knock on the wall. Shortly thereafter, we asked for the spirit to reveal itself, which was followed by a full-bodied apparition emerging in the corner of the room, which appeared to be a male, possibly bearded. I ran out of the room, yet didn't feel threatened. More so, my mind was trying to process what I'd just witnessed. Years later, my grandmother captured what appears to be F.O. Stanley in the main stairwell near his portrait. I highly encourage enthusiasts and skeptics to either visit the Stanley Hotel or the town of Eureka Springs, Arkansas, the downtown area, if they want a chance to experience something beyond the general realm of normality. The present hotel in Eureka Springs is yet another hotel I've had odd experiences in, although not as intense as the previous two stories, yet in some ways they were. I had stayed there in 2016 and took the ghost tour. The hotel was at one point a hospital ran by a quack named Norman Baker, who claimed he had the cure for cancer, local spring water mixed with watermelon seeds and other ingredients which was injected into patients. People inflicted with cancer rushed to the hospital, while Norman Baker would write letters on their behalf, asking the family for more money, stating their condition had improved. There was an area in the basement that was once used as the morgue. Prior to COVID, guests were locked in the basement. Upon panning around with my phone camera, I noticed what seemed like 40 to 50 orbs in this room, yet only got one or two in photos. During a tour of the Basin Park Hotel, we downloaded an app which was supposed to be a spirit box. I had written the app off as a hoax after seeing nothing but nonsense come through on the screen. Upon arriving home, I asked the spirit box if any victims of the Crescent were present. The meter immediately began to pick up and continued to beep at a rapid rate, answering my question, were you abused at the Crescent Hotel by Dr. Baker? To which the box replied, always, and I told them what an injustice it was that such horrid events occurred with such little consequence to the Dr. Baker, and that I was sorry this happened. My room grew to be very cold. This was mid-spring, and it was at least 75 degrees outside. Then the box said, scared, followed with, going home. My room returned to normal temperature, and the spirit box began to operate normally. The following happened when I was on a school French history trip to France and Belgium back in 2014, which incidentally was the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. However, the paranormal events which occurred in this short trip had nothing to do with the many mass grave sites and historical locations we visited. In fact, they all occurred in the first basic and cheap hotel that we stayed in for the first two nights. The hotel, which I've since forgotten the name of, was bordering on a hostel. It was six of us to a room, three bunk beds, and I was sharing with one of my closest friends. I also knew the other boys fairly well. I remember that on the first day, we had been awake for well over 24 hours. So upon arriving at the hotel, we didn't pay much attention to how it looked. However, we found it surprisingly hard to get to sleep immediately. The first strange occurrence happened while everyone was casually chatting as we lay in bed, probably around 11 at night. Each bottom bunk had a light underneath it, and they were all controlled with one central wall switch by the door. I should mention that we had all of these lights off as we were meant to be asleep. However, in the middle of our conversation, one of the lights suddenly turns on. It stopped our conversation dead, and we were all silently confused. 
This happened several more times, with lights going on and off under the bunks, while the wall switch didn't move. Everyone was getting visibly spooked at this point. However, one of the boys had found a second switch beside his bed, and we soon realized that every bunk had these controls for these lights. With everyone relaxed again, our 14-year-old imaginations calmed down significantly, and everyone began to nod off, one by one. Later in the night, at what I estimate was about one in the morning, I was still half awake. I've always been a very light sleeper. I was listening to the deep breathing of everyone in the room when I heard an audible click. I turned around and saw that the light to the walk-in shower was on. I assumed that someone had walked in to play a prank. But after quickly scanning my eyes about the room, I could see that everyone was in bed. I was confused, but not frightened. Yet. Shortly after, the shower turned on seemingly by itself. And I again turned over to face the walk-in shower. Sure enough, through the crack in the door, I could see the shower water running. I turned away quickly and lay there for hours, unnerved, before falling asleep. The next morning was busy, visiting several historical sites, and it wasn't until lunchtime in the cafe that a few of us brought up the night before. Several others testified to being awake when the light and shower turned on. We were all slightly unnerved, but it wasn't until the next night that things really kicked off. On the second night, everyone fell asleep very quickly. But as per usual, I could not sleep. I lay awake slightly nervous, and the main light of the room went on and off at intervals of around ten minutes or around an hour. Then, at around two in the morning, I heard a huge crash, and I looked around to see that the shower door had swung open completely, hitting the wall. The light was on, and the shower was running. I was terrified. I turned to face the wall and didn't open my eyes until the next morning. The next day, we moved to a different hotel, and the subject of the hotel being haunted was only brought up once more during the trip. Although this is one of the smaller experiences I've had regarding the paranormal, it sticks with me due to how unexpected it was. We found out that the original owner of the hotel had died from cancer, but I saw no evidence or reason that whatever caused the disturbance was her ghost or spirit. It is an experience that will always stick with me as being strange and spooky. I work in a Hampton Inn and Suites, and I've always had paranormal experiences throughout my life, but I recently started working 10pm to 6am, doing audit at the hotel. I'm by myself and things seem to be more active on this shift. I've spoken to other employees and they've noticed weird things happening, and a few have even seen figures. They've told me about elevators opening and closing without anyone in them, things falling over from across the room. Movement sensor lights going off in locked rooms that no one has access to. Things like that. Innocent things, and I didn't think much of it. I noticed things like that on my 2pm to 10pm shift, when I first started working but kind of brushed it off. I was the only one on the shift, but there was a constant flow of people in and out of the lobby. So I was around people a lot. My first night working 10 to 6 was with someone, so he could train me. The radios got staticky and loud at around 2.30 or 3am. He said we just have to turn them off because they do that sometimes. So the next day I came in and made sure to turn off all the radios when I got there so I wouldn't have to hear it. 2.30 to 3am rolled around and the radios 
started making their sound again. You can understand my confusion and fear. I made sure they were all off. The motion light in the PBX room turned on. It's pretty much a big room full of computers and it controls all of the Wi-Fi and systems the computers run on. I'm the only one on shift and no one else is allowed in the back. I walk back there. No one. I shrug it off and head to the kitchen. It's about 3.30 at this point and again, the motion light turns on in the pantry. The door was closed but I could see the light turn on from the crack underneath the door. Things like this happen a lot now but it freaks me out the most when I'll be walking around and feel someone tug on my ponytail or lanyard. Again, I'm the only one on shift and no one else is around. I'll be walking so there's no effort to snag on. We also have plexiglass dividers to separate us from the guests and I can see my reflection in them. I tend to see movement behind me in the glass sometimes. A wall is behind me so no one is walking behind me without me noticing. It freaks me out but I don't think it's out to hurt me. I don't know what entity is at this hotel but it seems to be much more playful than the others I've encountered. Tonight, I heard something fall over when I was walking in the back office. The top to a large hand sanitizer bottle was taken off and laying on the floor with the bottle laying spilled on the counter. This is just a short list of things that happen on my shifts. I'm getting used to it but it still freaks me out. This story I'm about to tell is about a hotel in Kuala Lumpur. It's pretty famous and if you know hotels well enough, it's one of the more popular ones which comes with a kitchen and a huge bathroom in the Golden Triangle with a pretty huge forest reserve right next to it. After finishing my work at about 1am, I decided to call it a night. I turned off my laptop, made sure my iPad was in sleep mode and crawled into bed. At about 3am I woke up to my phone lighting up, like I was getting a phone call or alarm ringing. I took it but there was nothing, feeling it was just an isolated incident. I placed the phone down next to my bed. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the screen on the iPad begin to power on and off a few times, not just once. This was strange as it was always off. At this point I sat up at the corner of the bed. But directly ahead of me, I notice the TV is doing the same thing. The lights are coming on and off in no specific order. At this point, I'm a bit freaked out, so I turned on all the lights with the master switch, and everything is back to normal. After about five minutes or so, I got back under my blankets and turned the lights off. My windows are facing the forest, and I could see the shadows of the trees right in front of me. The curtains were slightly open and I got the strange but very real sensation that I was being watched. It was seriously overwhelming. I sunk lower into my bed. What happened next I have no explanation for, but it was terrifying. I began to hear knocking and thumping noises on the window and then screeching noises began to appear. Imagine someone dragging their fingernails down a wall. That's what it sounded like. Knowing I'm staying at a decently high level, with no balcony and no tree branches within 20 feet of the windows, this was not a natural sound and I was praying like mad, begging for the sound to go away. I don't know how I managed to fall asleep that night, but I did. I experienced one pretty spooky incident once. My work requires me to travel a lot to most countries in Asia. Most of the hotels I stayed in are the usual four-star business hotels, from the newer boutique types, while others range from older and aging hotels from the 80s to run-down digs in rural provinces. When I traveled to Jakarta, I would stay in this old business hotel outside the city. I've stayed here several times and had no issues, no late night knock on the door as warned by my host there. But during my last trip, I was pretty spooked. This is one of those hotels with the old-fashioned elaborate console that controls the lights, has a radio, etc. So the first few nights, I switched off the bedside lamp using the console. One night, after an hour or so, 
the light suddenly came on. I switched it off and went back to sleep. Then, it came on again. It happened a third time and by now I was spooked. In the end, I unscrewed the bulb. On the last day, on the way to the airport, my host there pointed out an abandoned building downtown and said that it was so because it was haunted by a Pontiac. Apparently, a security guard saw it in the toilet and went insane. Naturally, I was reminded of my episode with the lamp. It was later that I found out that Indonesia has some of the most haunted buildings in the world. Some backstory. I live in a small town in Canada and my house was built in 2007. Before that, it was farmland. My great grandmother and her kids immigrated here from Ecuador in the 70s. Throughout my family's bloodline, every woman in the house is believed to have some sort of sixth sense. My great grandmother's sister was a powerful medium. My grandmother's older sister is also a medium and reads palms. My mother does tarot readings and informs me on her past experiences with ghosts when she lived in Toronto with my grandmother and great grandmother. Ever since I was a baby, I've been seeing ghosts everywhere. My grandma told me that I would point to the corner and talk to it like somebody was there. I'm 16 now and have been living in this house for the past 15 years. Paranormal experiences have been happening to me for as long as I can remember, so it's just a normal thing now. My mum doesn't encourage me thinking about these things though. She tells me that it's all in my head. A month ago, my dad's parents came up from Texas to renovate our basement. On their last day, my grandpa told me that he thinks that our basement is haunted because of the voices he hears near the cold room. I told my mum about this and she lowered her voice to tell me that she lied to me. She said that it wasn't all in my head and that I've been seeing ghosts. She used to keep me in her room as a child and pray to God to keep the spirits away from me because she saw them too. So far, I've noticed one ghost or entity or something that keeps reappearing in different places. I first saw her when I was eight or nine. Me and my cousin saw her in my closet. She had pale skin, long blue-black hair, and wore a deep blue dress. The most notable feature is that her nails are painted a shiny metallic blue that glistened in the dark. She held her hand out to us, and we ran away. The second time was when I was 11. At the time, I had a loft bed that was up near my ceiling. My bedroom was on the second floor. I was lying on my bed after coming home from school and saw that lady slowly walk by my window. Her nails were still painted that shiny blue. That was the most notable ghost I've seen. Apart from that, me and my younger brother, 13, both saw a glass cup on our table slowly slide over to the other side of it. I always see figures in my room and hear music in the shower drain. My entire family hears people talking in our bedrooms. Me and my brother have started to wake up with long scratches all over us. The house was blessed by a priest when it was made, but I don't think it worked. I'm getting scared and I don't know what to do. Hey everyone, I apologize for some formatting issues, I'm on mobile. I think my house is haunted or I'm going crazy. It started around a week ago. For some background, I live in a 1920s home. I live with two other people who are currently out of town. If it's relevant, the house flooded a couple of weeks ago. There's black mold, but it's very sparse. Also, the back door doesn't lock, so it could be someone coming in. Also, there is an attic which I don't have access to, which is supposedly flooded after the maintenance man came to have a look after the flooding of the house. A few weird things have been happening. For example, today, I wake up in the morning and go to the bathroom and keep in mind again, my roommates are out of town. I find the pot plant on the top shelf has been knocked over Keep in mind that I do own a kitten, but she can't even push down a 250 gram container. She's only 5 weeks old and can't jump on the bed without help. The toilet seat is also up, which as a female, why would I ever do that? 
I work from home most days. I go into the kitchen for a drink and the microwave door is wide open and not closed. I don't use the microwave at all. Few other things have been happening as well. I'm quite particular about how I position my soaps in the shower. I've been noticing for the past week, but they haven't been in the spot I left them in. I thought I was going insane, so I started taking photos before and after my shower to confirm where I've left them. They are definitely moving. Not to mention, there's a brown boot mark on the white tile, when again, I don't leave the house, nor am I that shoe size. I've checked with all my shoes, none of them match. I like to order Subway, a bit of a Subway fiend. I order a foot long, but save half to eat later. I pop that in the fridge and never got around to eating it, as I had a few work events that I had to attend in person. Very rare. The subway, I notice, is also gone today. No one has been home, so I'm confused who ate it. To make me sound even crazier, I ran out of makeup remover the other day, and I go to reach for a cleanser that I don't like that I got as a free gift from a pharmacy and I've noticed that it's literally been duplicated. I now own two of these very specific cleansers that look exactly the same. I never went out of my way to purchase this product, considering that I don't even like it. Why would I buy it again? I don't even use cleanser on the regular, usually just micellar water. Been feeling like I'm going crazy, but I'm aware of it. It's all very real. I have photos backing up what I'm seeing. What do I do? I used to live in a haunted guest house for about a year. So many crazy things would happen that I have absolutely no explanation for. It's a bit long, but here is a list of things I remember would happen. Weird noises and voices. I'm hearing impaired, so I wear hearing aids, and I know that spirits tend to communicate through electronic devices. I would hear voices and laughter quite frequently. I had a roommate, and I swore to him that I kept hearing these things. One time, I heard laughing again, and asked him, do you hear that? And he said no. I told him, they're laughing right now, it's loud, you can't hear that? He couldn't hear anything. My items would be moved around. I remember this one time I found my vase with flowers in my laundry hamper. I was like, WTF. I'd only gone to work that day and my roomie hadn't been in the house that week. I texted him, asking if he put my vase in the hamper and he said no. As far as I know, nobody had access to the house, including the property owner. My roomie told me that he had his ex come over one time before me as she claimed she saw an older man with a beard behind him when he was talking to her. It was only a split second and he disappeared. He wasn't able to see him but his ex did. I probably saw the same older man with a beard. I was headed to bed and I saw an apparition of an older man with a beard. I ran out of my room so freaked out and told him to sleep with me. I was very afraid of sleeping alone. We slept in the same room for a few months. I would constantly get sleep paralysis every single night at that place. I wasn't stressed out or anything, even though the place was haunted. But every night, I had sleep paralysis. I wouldn't get sleep paralysis anywhere else, just that place. My roomie found a tube of lipstick rolling on the floor. He asked me if that tube of lipstick was mine. It wasn't. I asked him if maybe it was one of his girlfriends. He said it wasn't theirs. It just appeared out of nowhere. He would have random objects appear to him, not belonging to anyone we knew. These spirits were tidy. There have been several instances where I'd leave my bedroom with my shoes thrown around and my bed unmade. I'd come home to my shoes being nicely put away with my bed made. Rumi says he never tidied up my personal space. After all these instances, I decided to install a security camera, with my Rumi's permission of course. I would see him come into my room. I had the only bathroom. Weird layout, I know. But he would never touch my stuff. The camera also came with night vision when movement was detected. Once again, I leave my place untidy. 
Rumi was never in my room. Nighttime falls, and the next morning my shoes and bed are made. Cameron didn't pick up anything. Nothing would ever happen during the daytime, just at nighttime with my stuff being moved. Finally, I caught movement. I was spending my usual weekend with my boyfriend, now husband, and something triggered the night vision on my camera. It looked like someone walked right in front, and then you can see an outline of a little girl, and a shadow, possibly a man, walking. The video only lasted 5 seconds, and they were gone. No, it's not light from the window. The guest house was too far from getting lights from the street, and the curtains were blackout curtains. Not a bug either. I don't know how bugs can look like what was on the video. I remember sending my video to a medium, and he said it's definitely spirits caught on camera. He told me, before I could even mention it, that there's a young girl and an older man haunting the place. The only history about the house was that the property used to be abandoned. Homeless people would stay here, and teens would use Ouija boards there. That's a possibility for the haunting. My wife and I bought our house almost three years ago. The very first night we were there, while lying in bed, about to fall asleep, we heard a loud knock on the kitchen floor, as if something very heavy fell. We jumped out of bed to find nothing, as we hadn't unpacked anything. Over the next few weeks, we would hear the doors in our basement open and shut. Several times I'd get up, go down to the basement, completely finished and not a creepy, dark, scary basement, to see if anything was out of the ordinary. There would be no one and nothing out of place. Over the time, activity would mellow out and ramp back up again. My wife and I would both on occasion catch someone standing in the kitchen, and we walked by the kitchen door. When doing a double take, no one would be there. Most of the activities we are experiencing take place during the day, so I do not believe it's being spooked by the dark. My children have had so many strange occurrences. I was in the kitchen one day. My son, sitting on the stairs to the basement, jumped up and ran to me saying, The Batman is in the basement. I asked, Where? He replied, At the bottom of the stairs. Being a rational adult and not wanting our three-year-old to be afraid, decided to walk him down and show him there was nothing to be afraid of. We found no one. A couple weeks later, while I was at work, my wife and kids were home alone. My wife was in the bedroom, my son in the living room playing trains, screamed and ran to my wife shouting, The bad daddy is in the kitchen! Sometime later, my wife, kids, and I were in the living room watching TV while the kids played. Both my son and daughter stopped at the same time, looked at the kitchen, then followed something with their eyes down the hall into a bedroom, back down the hall and through the kitchen. Another time, the four of us were in the kitchen planting seeds for our garden in our seed starter trays, when our daughter stopped and looked at the doorway to the basement, smiled, and said, are you playing in the basement? She was two at the time and spoke clear as day to someone we could not see. Another time, we will hear our kids talk to someone while in their rooms alone. One Sunday morning while watching football, I was sitting on the couch with my back to the bedroom, open door. I decided to get up and make breakfast. The door was open when I walked to the kitchen. When I came back, the door was closed. I thought it was odd, but sat back down and continued watching the game. After a while, I got back up to go to the bathroom and noticed the door was open halfway. When I returned to the living room, it was shut again. The rest of the day, I sat in the chair adjacent to the couch so I'd have a full view of the door. We have had so many other strange encounters. These are a few I can think of off the top of my head. Activity seems to be growing and my wife wants to sage again. I try to be rational and remind her this is a 70-year-old house. There will be noises. But as a skeptic, I find it hard to be skeptical with the amount of activity we have.
I grew up in a small town. My house is one of the oldest ones in the town. We lived right beside three sets of train tracks. Growing up, I always heard voices. My friend heard them too in my house. They weren't regular voices, it's hard to explain. But if she didn't hear them with me, I would have passed it off as my imagination. It was only words here and there, but they came across like a dream. We heard them, but we knew they weren't there. Like a fast car zooming by. It was always a man, and we never knew what exactly he was saying. It was a regular occurrence when I was growing up that stuff would fly off the back of the toilet and hit the opposite wall in our bathroom. My mum finally told them to shut up, and it stopped. When I was about 12, my parents and my brother went to my brother's hockey game at the local arena. I stayed at home and had a bath. Our bathroom was on the left of a hallway, with a washer and dryer on the right, and a door leading to an old office room that had stairs going to the basement. As I was having my bath, I heard heavy boot steps come up the stairs towards the back door. All of a sudden they stopped, and then they were outside of the bathroom door and it sounded like something either kicked or punched the washing machine. It was loud. I was so scared I got dressed and ran away to a friend's house without leaving a note. I got used to the big guy and found out through a silhouette there was a woman in the house as well. She's not nice. She hangs around the stairs. Even now, at 31 years of age, if I go up the stairs at my parents' house, I always have this horrible feeling that someone is behind me and wants to pull me down. I've never had that feeling anywhere else. My nephew is autistic and would talk to the ghosts. When my nephew was four, he told my mum that the man's name is Sonny and that Sonny watches us. He told her that if we wanted to see Sonny, we would have to go down to the basement and dig. Sonny died falling on the train tracks. He doesn't like the woman and won't go up the stairs alone, so I don't know much about her other than she is not nice. I have many more experiences, but I think I'm done for now. I hope it made sense and was a good read. We sold our house because I think it's haunted. I've written about this before, but in the wrong subreddit, which was deleted. It was titled, Bathroom Double Take where I described a doppelganger-like situation with my husband. So if anyone had read about that experience and is now on this post, this is an update. After a few months of us living in this home, in which we plan to use as our second home, we have decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are aware of my claims and have made an informed decision to purchase this home, despite my claims. They probably think I'm a nut. This home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. We have gotten an air quality test done in the home, both my husband and I have gotten physical examinations, and nothing out of the ordinary has come out of these tests. Now I will get into my experience. We bought our winter home last year in June of 2021. Originally, we're from Canada, but we have spent the majority of the pandemic between the USA and recently Costa Rica. My first experience was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom when you enter the room. If you go to the left, you will go towards the bathroom. If you go to the right, you will end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon while I was showering, I watched my half-naked husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and then turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. This is when I saw my half-naked husband enter the bedroom again with the lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked my husband if he re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said he only came into the bedroom once, and has been there for the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed he saw me leave the kitchen and walk towards the mudroom. 
He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty, only to find out that I had been gone for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car dragging on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block. Every time he parks in the garage, you hear the distinct sound of the bottom of the car scraping the driveway. When I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard the sound unlock the door just to find out he isn't home. We've both heard unexplainable whistling sounds that stop once we acknowledge the sound. I guess it could be the vents, but for three days last week, our thermostat stopped working and we still heard the whistling. There have been other trivial occurrences. I once woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. We have those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those open on their own sometimes. I understand with modern upgrades there are going to be malfunctions, so I put those experience under the questionable category. So we've spent the past week packing our things. We are those psychopaths that do not store anything in our garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that is found in the garage is the water softener tank, that's it. So one lovely night, the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police. And of course, the neighborhood security also comes by just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage, with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of the house three days before closing. We could not bear another day there, and our neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I have no idea what she is talking about because we moved out. I may sound like a kook, but we've lived in so many houses, and we've never experienced anything like this. Edit. I forgot to mention, this house was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that I think was built in the 60s. I experienced some strange and freaky things living in an old house when I was 16. My parents bought it years ago and sold it within six years of living there. I'd get home from school and was in the computer room downstairs and there was a few times where I would randomly hear someone call my name in my mother's voice. When I used to get up to look around the house and respond with, what? I was completely alone in the house. My sister used to hear my dad call her name from the first floor of the house while she was in the second floor in her room. When she went downstairs, she was completely alone in the house. That day, she just took off in her car and left the house because it freaked her out so much. Another night, I fell asleep in my parents' room, so my parents went to sleep in my room. Around 3 a.m., they heard three hard knocks at my bedroom door. My dad responded with, come in, but no one did. So he got up and looked around to find us all asleep. When we first moved into the house, my dad found a collection of bowling balls in the garage that he immediately threw out after moving to clear out the space. Months later, my brother and grandmother used to hear bowling balls falling down the attic stairs, and there were no bowling balls in the attic. And this is when my father shared with them. He found those bowling balls in the garage when we first moved in. The creepiest situation that happened to us was a night when my parents saw me walk into their room in the middle of the night. I was wearing a vintage, laced, black turtleneck dress, and I stood at the end of their bed. My mum asked what I was doing up. I supposedly stared into her eyes and stood there in silence. She asked me to go to sleep and dozed off. When she opened her eyes again, I was missing. She then asked my dad if he ever saw me leave the room. He said no. So he then got up to check on me, and I was asleep in my room wearing a red pajama t-shirt. During this time, I went through a serious state of bulimia, depression, and isolated myself often, as I felt too self-conscious and insecure to go out and show myself. 
After selling the house, the new owner also experienced paranormal experiences, like getting her legs pulled down the basement staircase one night. We eventually did research and found out an older woman had passed in the house previously to us moving, but we don't know what kind of spiritual activity happened while she was alive with her family. The experiences we had are connected to demonic activity. Demons are the only ones capable of imitating human voices or taking on human forms. I always wonder if something sinister has attached itself to me since living in that house, as life has gone into a very dark, endless spiral of bad circumstances and bad luck for me ever since. When I was younger, around 12, my dad moved into a house. Now, this house always gave me weird vibes. It constantly felt like I was being watched. I couldn't sleep with my door open or without the TV on. Now, this is going to be two separate stories put into one. The first experience I had was around 2 a.m. I was in the living room watching TV. It was the weekend, so I was staying up not having a bedtime. Now, the layout of my house was slightly weird, and the living room was dead center of the house, surrounded by dark hallways and rooms. I started hearing noises in the kitchen, but thought nothing of it because we had dogs. A couple of minutes go by, and I can faintly hear my parents in their bedroom, doing stuff. They were being loud, so I went to turn to look in the direction of their room. I was sitting with my back to the hallway, and as I'm turning, clear as day, I hear a child's voice in my ear say, Don't turn around. I froze in place, absolutely paralyzed with fear. Then, I felt a tug on my hair. I promptly jumped up and turned on every light in my house as fast as I could. I didn't hear anything for the rest of the night, but needless to say, I didn't go to sleep until the sun was up. Fast forward to a couple of months later, it's Christmas Eve. Me and my sibling were sent to bed to prepare for Santa to drop the parents off. It was around midnight and I was laying in bed watching TV. I was too excited about presents to sleep. I saw something out of the corner of my eye and looked over at my closed door. As I looked over, I saw a bright blue mist figure float through my door. It was glowing, but not enough to light up my room. I watched as it floated from my door and then through my closed closet door. I was once again absolutely shocked. I covered up my head with a blanket for a couple of minutes until I felt better. I then laid on my side, facing the other side of my bed. The blanket took the shape of someone lying next to me. I laid there and watched as the blanket moved as if someone was breathing. This went on for a couple of minutes, and then suddenly, the blanket laid flat on the bed again. This all happened 12 years ago. And at the time, I told myself I was just imagining things. However, the older I get, the more I'm convinced something was up with that house. When I talked to my dad about it, he told me some stories they had about hearing a little boy when no one was there. I've done research on the house and never found anything. However, as we moved out, we found handprints made in the concrete on the driveway. Two sets of child's handprints with 1978 written underneath. Edit to add, I had three little siblings living with me at that house. However, during the first incident, they were all at their mum's. And during the second, they were sleeping across the house. So, two friends of mine and I went to Nashville to watch a football game a few weeks ago. We stayed at an Airbnb we have never stayed at before, but it was a good deal and we all got our own bedroom. The first thing we noticed was a door in the middle of the hallway that was not a bedroom. It was a door to the basement. The walkway down was as creepy as one could imagine. It looked like something out of the conjuring with stone walls and rickety stairs. My friends thought it was a little creepy, but I got an immediate feeling of uneasiness and discomfort. The hair on my arms stood straight up as my friends decided to go down into the basement and look around. The next thing we noticed 
was that the door would not close. There was no latch and no way to keep the door closed. So we decided to put a basket in front of the door to keep it shut. We went to the game and then out afterwards and got back to the house at around 2.30 a.m. The door was closed but the basket was pushed away from the door by about five feet. My friends didn't think much of it in their drunken state, but this really did not sit well with me. I begrudgingly went to my room to go to sleep, making sure to lock the door behind me. I woke up around 8 a.m. the next morning and heard the doorknob to my room slowly turning. The door being locked, it wouldn't open, and I figured it was my friends trying to get me out for breakfast. Then, I hear a very distinct shh coming from the other side of the door. Not thinking it was anything other than my friends, I just went back to sleep. About an hour later, my friends got back from breakfast, and I got up. I asked them why they tried to open my door this morning, and were shushing people. They both looked at me, confused, and asked what I was talking about. They were very adamant that they did not try to open my door, and they did not shush anyone. So, what do you think? Joking friends? Or something more sinister? So my friend, we'll call her A, and her boyfriend, J, were living in Bath, England at the time, and her sister, Mum, and stepdad, total skeptic by the way, came to visit them and got an Airbnb. They decided to stay there with them for a little staycation. The first night they were there, her sister was in the bathroom one night and could hear a woman sobbing outside the door. Thinking something was wrong, she leaves the room to find that everyone is asleep. All the lights are off, and no one heard the woman sobbing except for her. This happens multiple times while they're staying there, only to her sister. As I mentioned, her stepdad is a total skeptic and never wants to believe that anything is paranormal. The way the house is set up, the bedrooms are on the ground floor, the kitchen and living room are directly above, and the bathroom is off the staircase landing. In the middle of the night, late, like 3 or 4 a.m., A hears loud footsteps go from the living room to the kitchen. She thinks, that's weird that someone's still up. The footsteps then go from the kitchen to the bathroom and back to the living room. She thinks that it has to be her stepdad, because his footsteps are the loudest. In the morning, she asks him, Why were you up so late last night? I heard you walking around at like three o'clock. He says, I thought that was you. A and J have their own bedroom. The first night, they close the door and go to bed, and a few minutes later, the door flies open. It doesn't creepily creak open. It deliberately flies open, like someone is pissed about it being closed. This happens every night. On the last night, when it happens, A almost doesn't care anymore, but J becomes extremely startled and tells A to look at the door immediately. They both see a disembodied hand holding the doorknob. They both saw it there, and it stayed there as if someone was staring back, until whoever's hand it was eventually walked away. Later, when she was telling a friend about where they stayed, she said, I know that place. Was it this address? And A said it was. Not only was her friend familiar with that house, but she had known someone who was a housekeeper and had worked there before. They said that they would never, ever go back there because it was haunted as hell. This is 100% true. A and J are the realest people I know. Her stepdad is still a bit skeptical, but is officially terrified of this house. A 
I wanted to share this story to warn people, but it is not necessarily a creepy encounter, just sort of a story that is weird and freaked me out. I'm traveling around the country in my car. I've been driving for over a week from the city I lived in and have so far slept in my car to save money. It wasn't until I got to a big enough city that I decided to treat myself to an actual bed that would be comfortable. I opted to choose Airbnb because it is cheaper than hotels. I booked this Airbnb the day before I arrived to the city, so there weren't many options left. I'd found this apartment on Airbnb that looked very new and modern, and it was in a great location. The price was decent for its location and it almost seemed too good to be true. The only downfall was that it was listed as a new listing and had zero reviews. I figured that the price was low because it was a new listing and decided to give it a shot. Must be legit because it's Airbnb, right? When I got to the apartment building, it was older looking than I had expected. I later found out, or realized, that my Airbnb was most likely the only renovated apartment in the building, and the building seemed to be in poor condition. It looked more like a dorm hall rather than an apartment building. Anyways, I let it all slide because I wasn't paying too much, so what could I expect? The apartment itself looked like the pics, so that was good enough. Everything went well for the first two days. As a female traveling alone, I always make sure to be safe. I don't go out when it's dark and I always lock the door. Every single lock, including the chain thing. Anyways, on the third day, I was out all morning and came back to the apartment to change to head to the beach. I had again locked the door, including the chain. I was in front of the door watching TV while changing, when the door suddenly unlocks and someone opens the door. I am beyond lucky that I had put the chain lock on the door, or else it would have opened all the way. I was naked and no one else was supposed to have the keys. My first reaction was, excuse me? And I closed the door right away, locking it again. I came from the back of the door and did not look or see who was opening it. I sat in front of the door, scared and shocked, realizing that this person could technically still get in here since they obviously have the keys to the apartment. At first I thought maybe it was the owner coming back after I checked out, but I was not supposed to check out until the following day, so it was not possible. After crying for a few minutes, I recuperated myself and called the owner and told her what had happened. She told me that no one else should have a set of keys other than her and I, and that she is at work and it was not her. I was scared to stay in the apartment because someone could come in. I didn't want to leave because I had all my valuables there. It was a lose-lose situation. I think I called my dad who told me that it was not okay that someone has the keys and that she needs to take care of this ASAP. So he talked with her and she told me she would be there shortly with a locksmith to change it and give me a pair of new keys. She then proceeded to tell me that she had only had this apartment for six months and that before I stayed there, there was only one other Airbnb booking. She also mentioned that it had been sitting empty other than those two bookings because she had been renovating the apartment, which now makes sense why the building looks like absolute shit and doesn't match the apartment. She told me that the only possibility for who that was could be the previous owners or somebody related to them. Isn't that illegal though? That possibility or theory really messed with me. How is it possible that I was gone all day, every day, and the 10 minutes I was home during the daytime, someone tries to come in? Did they know I was there? What were they coming in for? If this apartment has been sitting empty for half a year, maybe they did this frequently, or maybe they saw me come in and tried to do something to me. These questions are constantly on my mind. I just know I am so lucky that I put the keychain on the door or else I don't even want to know what else could have happened. Needless to say, I won't be leaving a good review and I won't be staying in an Airbnb that has no reviews or seems too good to be true.
to start off. I'd like to say that nothing like this has ever happened to me or my boyfriend. And the two of us were more on the non-believing side before it happened. We still can't believe, process, or understand what happened to us. My boyfriend and I were on vacation in the upper peninsula of Michigan, staying at an Airbnb on St. Mary's River in Salt St. Marie. It was an older three-bedroom house with its own nice private beach, and we had the entire place to ourselves for the night. We started off the night by leaving to get some food, playing Monopoly, going swimming, etc. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred. As soon as it got dark, we went out to smoke before we ate the food we had just bought. We went back in, had our dinner, and went to the master bedroom. We were both on our phones, when the light on the ceiling fan started to flick on and off. I said that the house was old and suggested we turn the lights off. He said no and that we should keep it on. This is when he first told me that he had a bad feeling. I walked out the hallway to the living room to see if I could sense the energy he was feeling and he followed me. I felt as if nothing was wrong and went back to the bedroom. He stayed in the hallway staring at a closed bedroom door. I asked why he was staring at it, and he said, I swear I just saw the light in this room turn on and off. I was more concerned about a person being in this house, and I said we needed to go in there and look. We walked in, checked under the bed and in the closet, and nobody was in there. He became really startled, and I was just really confused. He said that the dresser had just been shaking really aggressively against the wall. I was skeptical since I hadn't seen it myself, but I said I believed him, and we left the room. After we were back in the living room, he said, I have a really bad feeling like something bad is going to happen if we stay here. We need to get out of here. We had nowhere else to go until the next day, and I didn't want to leave, but I agreed that we'd go for a drive come back after and get our things and leave if he still felt the same way. After we finished driving, we went back into the house and he still had this bad feeling. I still didn't want to go, but I agreed that we would get our things and leave. We walked into the master bedroom first and the light switch for the ceiling fan and light was off. We had left it on. My boyfriend said, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Look at the fan. It was moving slowly in a circle, and as soon as I looked up, it began moving faster, but inconsistently, as if someone was batting at it. The light began to flick on and off again. Mind you, the switch is still off at the wall. This was enough for me to start freaking out, so we grabbed everything out of there and the master bathroom and got the hell out of that room. Next, we went to the kitchen to do our dishes, since this is a requirement for checkout. My boyfriend reached into a drawer, pulled out the biggest knife in it, and turned his head to look at me. He said nothing, and put the knife down and closed the drawer. I assumed he was trying to show me that it was there in case there really was another person in the house. He started visibly freaking out, and I asked what was wrong. He said, I'll tell you in the car. We packed up, locked the house behind us, and hit the road. I asked him what he had been so afraid about, and he said, that thing was talking to me the entire time. It got control of me when I reached for that knife, and it told me to stab you. I had to stop myself and fight it. He continued on saying that he had been listening to these things the whole time, such as, hit her, and pick up that chair and throw it at her. Hearing this made me sick to my stomach. We ended up sleeping in my car at a rest stop, and neither of us slept well at all with this lingering awful feeling. Nothing has really happened to us since, so I don't think it is attached to us or anything, but I just can't fathom how it gains that much control over him in such little time.
As for the Airbnb owner, I did reach out and text her and ask if anybody had noticed any paranormal activity in the home. She said no, and that this was the first she'd heard of it. I suggested that she have the house cleansed, but I don't really think she was a believer, because she just said, wow, I'll definitely look into that. I didn't really want to go into details of what happened, because honestly, I don't think she would have believed me. Just before the pandemic hit, my girlfriend and I took a vacation into the woods of Vermont. Getting there was absolutely amazing. We took our vintage Jeep on the several hour journey and enjoyed the stunning mountain views as we lumbered along the dirt roads towards our rented vacation spot. As I said, getting there was amazing. Roads paralleling rocky rivers, the mountains, the trees, and the rumble of the engine. Honestly, I'm not sure any vacation spot can top the experience of getting there in that Jeep. The first night was a lot of fun. We sat in the hot tub, looking at the stars which were free of light pollution from the concrete wastelands that are cities. After a big dinner and probably too many episodes of American Dad, we went to bed. That night we heard an extremely loud boom coming from the front door, as if someone kicked it with everything they had. Honestly, I thought I dreamed it because I heard nothing after that. But the next day, I asked my girlfriend if she happened to hear it as well. To my surprise, she said she had. The path to the front door is soft dirt, and there's absolutely no way to get to or from the door without leaving perfect footprints. Opening the metal door, I saw only our footprints in the dirt. But there was a dent in the door. This door was metal. It had to have been hit extremely hard by something that somehow left no trace. This was obviously a red flag, but I didn't let it consume me, since after checking everything else around the house and our vehicle, it was clear nothing else was touched. Night two's evening went much like the last. After a day of adventures, we sat in the hot tub, looking at the stars, had dinner and shows, then went to bed. This night would go a little differently though. After coming inside from the hot tub, I had a strong feeling that we were being watched. We are all familiar with this feeling, and typically there is a source, a window, tree line, just around the corner, you know. But not this time. It just felt like it was coming from literally everywhere, as if every inch of the house was just consumed with eyes staring. There was even more to this feeling. I was also under the strong impression that if I acknowledged this experience in any way, that it was suddenly going to get a lot worse. So I said nothing. Sleeping that night was hard. In terms of noises, there wasn't much that wasn't just a multi-hundred year old house settling. But the presence grew stronger. It felt like I was trying to sleep with strangers standing over me in the dark, and I certainly did not get up to pee that night. The morning of what would be our third and final night was a lot different. Until this point, the unsettling feeling was only at night, but this time, even in the morning, it was violently strong. I felt like at any moment, one wrong move was going to set 100 poltergeists off, tearing the place apart. Needless to say, getting out of there on another day of adventures was all too welcome. Staying in that house on our third and final night was an absolute nightmare. I felt like I was on some kind of drug. Laying in bed I got touched many times. My feet, shoulder, ear, hair and when I wasn't being touched I could hear breathing and these strange tingling feelings. There were all kinds of noises from the main part of the house as well walking, objects being moved, you would have thought there was a thanksgiving gathering going on out there. That hostile feeling grew more and more intense by the moment, and finally, at around 2.30am, I was ready to take us home. I was very worried as to what would happen if I mentioned what was happening, or even moved my body, but I knew 
I had to get us out of there. It was time to wake my girlfriend, throw everything in the back of the truck, unpacked, and go. Here's where it gets even worse. My girlfriend is an extremely light sleeper. If I so much as adjust my pillow, she wakes up. But not tonight. I tried shaking her, pushing her fairly hard, and talking to her, but she would not wake up. The stairs to the bedroom were very high, and if I made one wrong move carrying her, and she fell, it would surely kill her. So I decided that since I couldn't wake her, we were trapped. I certainly wasn't about to leave her in this dangerous situation alone. So I didn't sleep. She would not wake up. I kept getting touched, and the entire main part of the house was getting reorganized. The moment the smallest sliver of sun peeked over the distant mountains, all the action stopped. The hostility was very much still there, but at least the moving furniture and items had ceased. I was able to wake my girlfriend up, and we did what I wanted to do at 2.30am without saying a word. Obviously, this rushed morning without coffee or breakfast and absolutely no communication from me was confusing to her. But once the house was in my rearview mirror, we both started bringing up the hostile feeling. She also felt like acknowledging it was going to set it off like a bomb. She shared all the same feelings until our third night. She slept like a rock and felt as though all she did was blink and it was morning. Living in the rural northeastern region of the United States, you can't really be a complete skeptic of the paranormal. I never believed in the paranormal until moving out here. My childhood friends and I have all had many intense experiences. Some of these experiences we even had together. I don't know what was in that house with us. It certainly didn't seem to be just one thing. But it did not like guests, and a poltergeist infestation would not be out of the realms of possible diagnosis. It's no surprise that nobody else mentioned this situation in the reviews of the rental since the owners of the rental also review the guests. Nobody wants to be blacklisted on that app, and I am no exception. This place is just another reminder that, when out for a walk in the night, that watched feeling coming from the tree line, past the cobblestone fence, isn't always an animal, or your mind filling in the blanks that you can't see. Stay safe everyone. Hello watchers and listeners, thank you so much for watching. As always, a big thank you to all of the Reddit users who kindly allowed me to use their stories. If you want to help support this channel, you will find links to both my Patreon and my Teespring store in the description below. So feel free to have a look. And the biggest thank you to all of you who continue to support me. I truly do appreciate it. And remember, Papa loves you.